I don't know why Long Twitch had invited me, frankly, because <laughs> A, he has said everything, <laughs> which I wanted to say. Number two, he has boxed me into a corner, because <laughs> the World Bank is a very important partner for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm in a position to say, I don't know whether I agree with uh, what he said, but I don't know if I disagree either. <laughs> so either way, uh, this is a very serious subject. And uh, it's not about the lifestyle of some or others. It's about livelihoods. It's about even lives for some and no lives for others. When I'm talking about Ebola in Liberia, just think of that clinic up in Dover County. They cannot keep the vaccines in the fridge. They cannot uh, look at mothers who are giving birth. It's no longer a matter of lifestyle. It's a matter of livelihoods for some and lives for even others. And so I make no apologies here that I fully understand the importance of safeguards. It's not about safeguards. It's not about the environment. It's not about social issues. We fully agree. That said, we do in the African Development Bank 60% of our entire portfolio in infrastructure. And are looking to do more. We do coal plants, we do dams, we do highways, and we have no apologies to make. That said, we want to ensure that every time, whatever we can, we do it right. There is a professor in Cambridge who is a professor, my assistant, and Mrs. Lee there, and he happens to be a friend of mine. I love this book. Many of you have seen it. It's about trade and protectionism, but it applies to what we're talking about today. I go there, I'm fine. Tough luck for you. Throw away the ladder. But people in low-income countries are saying, no. If there's no ladder, we shall come the tree. We shall use every means possible to get up there. But I think we should be in a place where we can have a dialogue about how to do things right instead of here's a ladder or there's no ladder. Here are two students revising for the exams, honestly. On the right, they are nearby here, near Cambridge. So I don't know which hall it is, but they're working very, very hard for the future. But so are the people on the left, revising for the exams on the street. So this is not about lifestyle. It's about the future of these young people. And that's the choice we have to make. I'm not being emotional about it. It's a fact. This is what the African people would be telling me. And I would be failing my duty if I didn't do it. And this is why we do what we do. This guy is trying to operate a, a machine, basically running his feet like we did maybe in the 17th century. And this is the 21st century. Now, he's poor, but he works very hard. These are the numbers which Lant uh, was mentioning. Now, it's not simply a lack of power, it is a cost of power. We are now trying to attract a business from Asia because of this wage differential, but this is what it's that wage uh, advantage. If you look at Uganda on the right, a kilowatt hour of electricity, 25 cents per kilowatt hour. Liberia, which now is the news, is 58 cents per kilowatt hour, the highest in the world. And they don't have enough. So the people can compete uh, for some of these industries, like Ethiopia, plenty of water up there. But Ethiopia, as Lando was saying, to develop their huge hydro potential on the Blue Nile, they have had to look for other partners, not the traditional partners. So the Renaissance Dam is not being done by approaching the traditional partners. They've gone to other partners, looked for internal means, because the traditional partners will not touch the Renaissance Dam. And yet, Africa has so much hydropower potential. Clean? That is the, uh, the Inga Dam in the DRC. This thing can produce 40,000 mega, twice the Renaissance Dam. It's green, so good for our planet. But before you do this, you have to run over so many interest groups, which Lant was mentioning. So the chances are, as you try to figure out how to fund it, 
will have gone around many, many corners. And yet we can do it right. This is a dam in Uganda, which has cut the cost of power by 70%. But believe me, so this was my year as president, I was visited by tons of NGOs, some worried about the butterflies which have disappeared, others worried about people who have been displaced. I traveled to Uganda myself to check what has happened to the environment, to weigh the costs and benefits. Went through a process known as uh, what the bank record inspection to ensure that you know, the costs and benefits uh, were balanced. And we did right. But before I finish, because I think you said everything, here is something I want to look at. This is Eastern Liberia. <coughs> this is one of the areas where Ebola now is, uh, is, uh, is uh, almost quasi endemic. So it means to get even logistics there, to get drugs, to get doctors. I think Paul Farmer was there uh, some days back. He wrote an article about actually how Ebola is partly issues of poverty. So it's not lifestyle. Now, so President Ellen Self came to me to say, look, can you help us fix this highway some time back? Uh, for those of you who know Liberia also, that is the place where rebellion came from in the, in the 80s. So politically sensitive, economically important. So we looked at it. It goes through a dense forest. So there goes a safeguard, a dense forest. Now, I said, we'll do it anyway. That means cutting down the trees, but we'll do it. These guys used to take about six days to go from the coast to the place in the north. Six days. Now, the first thing we did was to make sure we can fix it quickly. It's not a tired highway. We did some, some things there. Cut down to about three days. Now, here's what you should think about and I'll stop. The president wanted us now to do a proper highway. <coughs> now, by the safeguards which you mentioned, it means that you have to put this thing on the website for three months and you wait in the three months, you do nothing. To allow for what are known as uh, sequesters, uh, people would complain about one thing or the other. Now, the president said this to me, President Salif. If you wait for three months, we shall be going into the rainy season. <coughs> if you go into the rainy season, this highway would be washed away. So we're going to have another huge delays to actually fix the highway. And so what I did the land was simple. I ignored the 120 days. I went to the board of directors and said, look, uh, I'm looking for a waiver. Let's do a vote. We did the vote. Some voted no. Others abstained. Others yes. We did the highway and we're now fixing it. And I believe that we did the right things. Clearly, some trees have to be felled. There might have some issues maybe with uh, people, I suppose, who lived around. But we believe we did the right thing. So the thought I want to leave with you, these choices for some might be about lifestyle. For others, might be about the environment. For others, might even be about illegitimate issues around safeguards. But for others, it's about life, livelihoods, here and now. So, an institution like mine, which works for low-income countries, must make those tough decisions. It means that low-income countries increasingly are looking at partners who look at these things in a way which is not about these intertemporal issues uh, of lifestyles. So my thought is that this is an issue which should not be dividing us, whether you're rich countries or poor countries. I think it's an issue for which we ought to find the sweet spot, because this planet belongs to all of us. We already believe in social uh, rights. We believe in doing things right. It can be done. Final thought, uh, Lance, and then I'll, I'll stop here. Just before the summit in Copenhagen, the, the COP summit in Copenhagen, so that South African government had asked us to be part of the funding of a big coal power plant in Pumalanga province. Maybe you know it. We were putting $1.6 billion, quite a lot of money. And you went forward because you look at the South African uh, grid, where they get from hydro, nuclear, and everything, and you decided we should do it. 
Now, some interest group came to me and said, look, President, we understand what you're trying to do. Why don't you wait after the summit in Copenhagen? Why do you want to do it now? Why don't you wait? My answer was, if this project is good after Copenhagen, it must be good now as well. There's no need to wait. And we went forward and put the money down to do the power plant. It is now being built. So, there ends my story. Thank you so much.